فسبح بحمد ربك وكن من الساجدين وعبد ربك حتى يأتيك اليقين صدق الله
man, a story of a leader, the story of a protector who protected like no other, the man who lived on the 23rd floor, who was the heartbeat of lives unknowingly to many, Moses Raymond Bernard, an angel on earth whose halo shines upon those that he knew, a smile which lit up a room of strangers whom he would warm to, a name which will never be forgotten nor torn apart, which holds so much weight that can never be denied against. One could never forget the night of the 14th, where God took his angel back from me. Moses Raymond Bernard was his name. Moses Raymond Bernard is his name, which shook so many souls on earth, one could not describe the night of the 14th. What broke hearts in pieces and filled eyes with tears, tears which hold so much pain, tears which will stream for years on end, tears which will never run dry. The story of a man who would light up the streets of Labrock Grove, a man who would give his last penny for nothing in return, a kind soul, a kind heart. Moses Raymond Bernard, whose name will forever live on. My name is Faruza Fiwerki and I'm a photographer and I created Golden Ashes as a way to tell our stories from and by the community and I guess my driving force was after losing my sister um, and her family at Grenfell I felt like people weren't telling their stories with dignity and with honour and with respect um, and actually a lot of the media wanted to portray them in a way that wasn't truthful. They weren't sharing who we really were um, before the fire and, and what it has felt like to live in the aftermath of Grenfell. I think one of the quotes that we got from this project was by Karim saying, you had a life before Grenfell and you have a life after. Um, and they're two different things. And I think being able to connect with other bereaved and survivors, sharing their experience has been um, really healing for me and comforting to know that I'm not alone um, and that we're not all alone. Together as we share our stories we know that we've been able to come through a lot of adversity and we've stuck together um, and we've somehow put one foot in front of the other and um, so I think that's why these stories are important and why they need to be told directly from us. So the portraits that I've been taking um, I've been shooting these over two years and meeting with bereaved family members, um, people who used to live in Grenfell, um, and local community who've been volunteering. So yeah, it's, it's a mix. It's a mix of different kind of perspectives and voices in here. Um, and there's a lot of people that I met for the first time um, to take their portrait and to, to have a conversation and get to know who they are. So this photo series is really um, centered around well-being. The reason is I wanted us to feel connected um, I wanted us to feel connected around our stories, but also um, the proceeds from the photo book going towards wellbeing charities was really intentional because I think through what I'd seen from how the government and how the media had handled this community, it was one that showed that they didn't care. They didn't care for our humanity, they didn't care for who we were as people, um, and that we weren't valued. And I think something about stopping and listening to someone's story and taking their portrait, it shows, it shows that you care and I think that's important that we need to, as well as telling our stories, we need to listen to our stories um, and, and that brings a lot of dignity um, and honour and witness to the grief and the trauma that we've gone through um, and that actually we do need to heal, we do need to support one another um, to keep moving forward somehow. Uh, so the exhibition is on right now at Freston Road um, and on the windows of Bramley Studio, um, which you can see behind me, and um, it will be up for summer 2021. Our Power Hub is named after Stephen Power, who was sadly passed away at Grenfell Tower. I wanted to do something in my dad's memory, so build a legacy for him, and just show the type of person that he was, instead of just being known as a victim from Grenfell. I wanted to show what he used to do on a day-to-day -day basis, in a sense where looking out for his community, looking out for people that lived in Grenfell Tower as well. Um, so basically we started Our Power Hub because, yeah, there was just like no support for a lot of people. Um, I just felt like there was quite a lot of people that slipped through the net. So we created our power hub to try and become the bridge, to just link them between the services that were there, well they didn't know they were there, 
um, and just yeah link them to the services that they needed to get help like the NHS Citizens Advice Bureau whatever it may be you know, Stephen Power I don't know if Bobby said this but you know he's a little Irishman that would fight to keep the Muslim room open or the dog park open or whatever it may be he was just always you know <laughs> coming at the um, council, the authorities, to so just try and make the community better. So we do we do a lot of things, we do a lot of activities, we help with mental health, that's that's where it all started from, trying to get everyone's mental health back, in a sense. Um, now, not everyone's good at sitting down in front of a therapist and talking and explaining your feelings. Like other people like to do different sort of therapies. We have the NHS that come as well, so what we do is, in before how, we, we told them, don't just go and start approaching and saying, oh, I'm from the NHS, we want to talk to you and that. It's like sort of ease it in, give it a nice friendly environment. And then after they've seen your face once, twice, three times, they, they tend to open up themselves. I find that boxing is a great tool to help, especially young men, you know, conquer a their fears, um, a get rid of, you know, aggression that's been held in. And boxing is a great tool for that. And it's a good way for them to release natural endorphins. I've been a man. People like to bottle things up. You know, I'm a man, I don't share, I don't talk, I don't communicate, but you need to be able to just talk, you know, and, and boxing is a great tool because you're constantly, you know, having back and forth, you're constantly communicating, you're constantly asking questions. They're asking questions about not just technique, but, you know, life issues. You know, it teaches you a lot of lessons. You know, when you get knocked down, it's about, are you going to stand up again? You know, are you going to carry on or are you just going to give up? You know, and with boxing, the motto is don't give up. I wanted people to experience how, I, how it made me feel because people would come up to me and said, wow, you've changed in such little time now. What are you doing? What's, what's worked? And I was like, look, for me, boxing's worked. Somebody else, football might work. For somebody else, it might be art. It might be music. It might be something else. But for me, it was boxing. So I brought a few people that was in, a, in similar situations as me and the feedback I got from them was great. They enjoyed it. They, they told me that um, basically you can't imagine what you're doing for me. And I didn't, I didn't expect that feedback. It's like we asked the community, we asked the um, participants, what is it you want to do? We, don't, we can't make the decision for them and say, all right, this is what we're going to do on this day. You might, whether you like it or not, this is what's happening. What we like to do is we like to ask them and the majority, whatever they want, we just do our best to make it happen. The long-term outcome is the, what we want to do is we want to empower our community again and the people in it. Like, let them know that, all right, so it's been a mad tragedy throughout and it's rippled throughout the whole community, but there is a way out of, it, out of this you, instead of just being so negative about it. And all we're trying to do is open doors and give kids and young adults opportunities that they wouldn't usually get. In December 2019, one of the Grenfell survivors joined our project and he's been with us ever since. He's now through development from the Community Leadership Programme. He's now a, a director of ours and our chairman. I joined the club in 2019 as I was doing an event uh, for some survivors and bereaved at the curve. And uh, he asked, well, Tyreek asked me if I wanted to play foot. And I was like, yeah, bro, come and support and see what you're saying. And I came a, a football training session and I enjoyed it. And well, we start, we start working together, uh, we start bonding and we form a relationship and he was like, he wanted to do so much for the community and people with mental health and disability as well. So I say, well, I love the idea as well. I always wanted to give back to the community for helping us from since 2017. So. Uh, my proudest achievement is to see like, you know, people with all different mental issues, all different disability, all different um, moods come together as one and we play and when we go on the pitch it's like we forget about everything and we play as brothers or sisters. You know when I joined I was like kind of the only girl and um, playing you know quite a lot and I just felt so encouraged you know by everyone you know, and they're like, you know, praising you, even if you do rubbish. It's like, because I didn't play football since I was 16, and I'm 39 now, and I'm playing so much football, my bones about, it's working, it's so good, and you know, it's good for the mental health. Yeah, it's just an amazing organisation that is going to just get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's all about well-being, really, personal well-being, you know, and collective well-being, you know, helping each other to kind of progress in life, or just manage day by day. 
because even since COVID, before and after COVID, a lot is happening. So that's why mental health and well-being is such a big thing at the moment. But on the mental side of things, on the trauma side of things, is is a mess, is a, is a total hell. And through the football club, through uh, Grenfell Athletic, through the community, through all the support I receive, especially coming from football, I feel safe. I feel comfortable, I feel relaxed that you know I have people to look forward to be around and spend time with and, and they come like my family, they, they is my family. As the saying goes, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. So why am I so fragile and shattered? Why are my thoughts scattered like a thousand pieces of glass? in many different rooms, unsettled, unable to see, dream, or imagine, unable to sing a simple tune. Sometimes I'm numb on autopilot, existing day by day. Other times, I relive that night as though it were just yesterday. I hold on tightly to the hope of justice being served so that safe homes become a priority and no voice is left unheard. Then I look into my son's eyes daily and I also wear his smile as if it were only so simple to have the faith of a little child. Hi everyone, we share today a uh, testimony for my two daughters, Fatihia and Hania, one by, by the nursery. That's what uh, part of Fatihia and Hania job he make and the children help him to do that. And just I want to share with you today from, we start from here, from where is my two daughters start to study nursery. And that's what we did before she's been a die from the, from the fair. I've been back home. I do good project. I make uh, mosque. I give the name Ashahidat by my wife and my two daughter. The last picture I get from Rania, a uh, day before the fire. She sent me the picture. She said, we're coming in, that's in Ramadan, we're from the mosque in this area, exactly. Uh, that's the place I meet Rania here, first time, before we get married. I met her here, we married here, we been stay here. Uh, Rani, she loved the, this place, Al Manar. Fatihia and Hani as well, when we come, they enjoy the time, is very happy. Always we ask me, Daddy, we need to go to mosque. I lost my love, my wife and my two daughters. So for me, personally, it's very, very, very important. Now, now, sometime I've been there. Sometime I go in the morning, sometime I go midnight, sometime I go in the daytime. Yes, I want to feel free when I've been there. A lot of memory come back in my head. Fat here, she's playing here. Hania, she's doing there. Rani, she's sitting there. One day we come from outside, we sit in there. That's why it's important for us. That's why we need this place to be in memory for just for all the area to remember who we've been lost there. We need, we need to be one, uh, one hand, one, one voice, one united. We need to get, just we need, uh, I need just all the people who is, who live around the tower in North Kensington. We need just one voice to say we need justice. We need to say just like everyone we say forever in our heart. Assalamu uh, alaikum. We are in the Zikra Sana Raba, the tower of Granfield. As I saw in the film, the first one of the nursery, which is the Caliph of Hiyah and Hania. I wanted to share with you the second one, because it was the last place يعني قبال 
حريق بيوم رانيا بعدت لي صورة وهي طالعة من هنا هذا المسجد اللي أنا اجتمحت فيه مع رانيا يعني أو اللي شفت في رانيا أول مرة تزوجنا هنا وعشنا هنا في 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 الشغة تبع المسجد فوق يعني كان وقت جميل قبال ما نمشي جران في التور ورانيا كانت تحب المكان ده جدا كان طوالي تيجي وفضحية و... يعني فضحية وهنية حتى هم كمان كان بيحبوا يجوا هنا كتير فكان يطلعوا من السكول من النيرسري يجوا هنا يقعدوا معي شوية أنا بكون شغال وبروحوا فهذا المكان نحن يعني أنا شخصيا بحب أروح هناك ساعات كثيرة أوقات مختلفة في اليوم يعني بقعد كده وبتذكر كنت بتكلم مع فتحية شنو مع هنية شنو مع رانيا كنا دائما نجي ماشيين نقعد في الحديقة شوية اللي جنب العمارة تحت فاحنا الحين يعني أنا واحد من اللي هم الناس اللي اللي هم اختاروهم لأنه يكونوا عن ال عن ال اسمه شنو الكوميونتي تبع العمارة الذكرى ف عايزين يعني المكان ده الذكرى تكون فيه دايما يعني موجودة وانه الناس ديل هم في قلوبنا يعني ما طبعا اكيد ما ما حنمحوا من ذاكرتنا وعايزين الناس في الحتة دي كلهم يكونوا صوت واحد ويد وحدي عشان نقدر ناخد بحق الناس اللي هم توفوا ديل يعني انتوا زي ما تشوفوا في المحكمة ماشية بس لسه ما حصل شيء احنا ما ما مستنين يعني الحمد لله هم في مكان جميل وفي مكان حلو وان شاء الله نحسبهم انه في الجنة يعني في حتة اجمل من اللي احنا فيها الحين بس لازم الناس اللي عملوا كده لازم يتحاسبوا ده بالنسبة لي انا شخصيا يعني انا الكلام ده قلت قبال كده قدام القاضي قلت لهم يعني يعني لو جمعت فلوس العالم كله ما ترجع لي كلمة بابا تاني فنحن لازم نكون متحدين نكون يد وحدي عشان نقدر يعني نحاسب الناس اللي عملوا كده عشان ده ما يحصل ثاني بالنسبة لل هو كان سألني أنت السنتين اللي فاتوا ما حضرت السنوية ما كنت هنا قلت له والله أنا كنت مسافر كنت بعمل في عمل يعني تأخير للأولاد الحمد لله بعد التوفيق من رب العالمين لي قريب الثلاثة سنة أو أقل من ثلاثة سنة كنت قاعد في السودان خرطوم مشيت عملت مسجد والحمد لله سميته الشهيدات باسم راني وفتحية وهنية نزال ربنا إنه يتقبل والمسجد يعني ما شاء الله إن شاء الله حتشوفوا الفيديو والصور منه وأنتوا حكموا عليه إن شاء الله حيكون فيه بعد يعني المدارس القرآن حيكون فيه دروس حيكون فيه باب للمساعدات للناس المحتاجين يعني أنا ما مشيت عملت بس إنه كونه مسجد يصلوا فيه خلاص لا حيكون عندي فيه حاجات تانية عندي فيه يعني أماكن لو إن شاء الله ربنا وفقنا وحس شغالين فيها تأجرت حنمسك بها تكون رعاية للأيتام يعني حنمسك فتحية حنشوف على قدر ما يكون عندنا حيكون عندها طفل طفلين حن يعني حنقريهم من, من البداية لحد ما هم إن شاء الله يكبروا ويتخرجوا هنية كذلك ورانية كذلك فنسألكم بس الدعاء إن ربنا يوفقنا غير الدعاء ما في أي شيء إن شاء الله وآخر شيء أحب أقول إنكم يعني تدعو لهم بالرحمة وللجميع ربنا إن شاء الله يصرف عننا وعن جميع البلاد الوباء وهذه الأشياء الصائرة وجزاكم الله خير My name is Hanan Wahabi. I'm a survivor of the Grenfell Tower tragedy. Um, I survived with my then husband and my two children, uh, who were aged 15 and 8 at the time. Um, and sadly, I'm also bereaved. Um, my brother, who lived on the 21st floor, um, passed away. My brother Adlaziz Al Wahabi, along with his wife Fauzia, and his son Yasin, aged 20, daughter Nuruda, aged 15, and Mehdi. His son, aged eight, sadly passed away in the tower. The reason why I chose to record um, in this space is because this is a memorial space. It's specific to my family who passed away. Um, 
and this is why I chose this space. Why this space is so important to me is um, there was a lot of discussion about what we would like to have here and there are five trees here representing the five loved ones, our loved ones who passed away in the tower. Um, the three smaller trees um, are, represent the front, represent the children who passed and the two bigger trees at the back uh, represent the mum and dad, my brother and his wife. The Grenfell Tower site is extremely important to me and to those who survived and those who were bereaved and all of those who were impacted in the you know, Lancaster West and the wider community. We need to decide what happens with that space, with the tower. The future of the tower needs to be and has to be our decision. Another really important thing for me is to ensure that the children are involved. We want to hear the children's voices. This is their future. They are our future and they are the ones who are going to continue the legacy and the memory of what happened there and it's important that they are never forgotten. Before the tragedy um, happened, I was one of the seven people in the Grenfell Compact. We spoke a lot with RB Casey, TMO, Ryden. They didn't listen to us. They didn't listen to us when we talked about safety aspects. They didn't listen to us when we talked. Any, any views that we kind of gave to them, they didn't listen. We were there speaking about our safety our loved ones, our space, our homes, our friends. My reason for being on this commission is because I want us to be heard. We will be listened to. We want to remember every single person who lost their lives. We want to remember and never forget every single experience and trauma that happened that night and continues to happen and will continue to feel, will continue to feel the rest of our lives. It's hard to believe that it's been four years now. And whilst of course this community still proves itself to be the most resilient and dignified and beautiful community of people I've ever seen. Um, it's also so frustrating that the inquiry is taking such a long time, that no legislation has been passed to make families safer, that no arrests have been made. And I'm really here just to tell you that there are so many of us in and out of North Kensington who remain steadfast in our support for you and our admiration and love for you and that you are not alone and that we will be here with you throughout this process. But on this uh, really painful occasion, um, we're just uh, sending you all of our love and um, we're going to be around for the long haul. So on behalf of the Grenfell Foundation as well, uh, we're sending love to you. I'm Ilaria Bonadè, friend of Giannino and Daniela, Marco's parents. They would like to thank Grenfell United for everything it does to never forget. On these particular days, they ask me to read this following letter addressed to Marco and Gloria. Dearest Marco and Gloria, four years have now passed since you are no longer with us. Many things have happened during these long days full of grief. Immediately after the tragedy, we thought to do something to never forget what happened to you in order to help other young people who love life and study like you. The main goal of Grateful Love, Marco and Gloria Foundation is helping young people in their studies and raise public awareness on safety, a topic that in Italy and in the world is often overlooked. You left on the 4th of March 2017, leaving behind your loved ones and with all the uncertainties that this decision means. Your beautiful and honest eyes 
express concern, but we knew you would not change your mind. You wanted to demonstrate that you could find your own way. We reluctantly accepted your irrevocable decision, but we were at the same time comforted by the fact that you were together. Unfortunately, from the start, there were some attack, but you were never involved, a sign of relief. After a first period of studying and perfectioning the English language, finally, the job of your dreams arrived, first for Gloria and afterwards for Marco. We were in seventh heaven, finally, after so many years of study and efforts, your dream was coming true. A lovely flat in the 23rd story, newly refurbished with a beautiful view of London, work, love, everything was too good to last. On the 13th of June, the tragedy. So incredible that to these days we still think it was a bad nightmare. Unfortunately, it's all true. You and your dreams. You and your love. Annihilated by human greed. 72 people killed in the most cruel and human possible way. And just to save a few thousand pounds in the refurbishment. With yourself, a part of us was killed too and keeps being killed over and over again by the immense pain generated by your absence. Who will make amend for all this grief and how? No amount will never be adequate. And will the people responsible for this atrocity keep leading their usual life? Ever understand the evil that was done to you and to us. Now, with the foundation dedicated to you, we are trying to make your memory never fade. But most of all, we keep our awareness always raised on the necessity to monitor safety and materials used in construction and refurbishment of homes and buildings in general. It is unfortunately very sad to hear almost every day that this keeps repeating. Bridge, cabaways falling down, deadly accidents in the workplace, fire, all with a common denominator, human greed. But we will never surrender. We will continue to remember you through our witness and the foundation dedicated to you, helped by so many people who love you. We dearly love you. A big hug to reach you wherever you are. Mam Daniela and Dad Giannino Thank you.
Clary Mendy, 1959 to 2020. Clary was a strong, resilient and determined woman. At an early age, she was a member of the Young Socialists. She was a fighter who fought hard for equality and justice and did not suffer fools gladly. She did not like injustice and like so many other families who lost loved ones in the Grenfell Tower, was devastated and angry by the avoidable deaths of our cousins Mary Mendy and Khadija Say. When she first came into the Grenfell community, she was aware of the divide and rule strategy at play, and she knew that it had to be overcome in order to get justice for all, leaving no stone unturned and those responsible to be held answerable and accountable. She set up humanity for Grenfell with the aim of including bereaved families survivors and the wider community. She fought for unity and the coming together as one to stand up and to fight for the truth and justice for Grenfell without divisions. In honour of the victims of the Grenfell Tower disaster, she coordinated the multi-faith Grenfell Tower National Memorial Service held at St Paul's Cathedral to mark the six month anniversary of the tragedy, bringing together bereaved families, survivors, the community, rescue workers from the emergency services and recovery teams, public support workers and volunteers. It was attended by more than 1,500 guests, also including members of the royal family, the Prime Minister at the time, Theresa May, the Labour leader, multi-faith leaders and popular figures that spoke out and gave their support to the cry and the shout for justice for Grenfell. She only wanted a united front to fight the fight for truth, justice, reconciliation and the prosecution of those responsible. Clary always had the spirit to champion the underdog and to try to bring change, justice and a sense of belonging and community to all. I have no doubt that she would have fought for Grenfell even if she had not lost family members. Such was her passion and drive for humanity. Sadly, 
Clary did not live to see justice for Grenfell, for our two cousins and all those who passed on that fateful night. I know the fight will continue and it is my sincere hope that justice will be done for the bereaved families, survivors, the wider communities. She will be greatly missed by many, but her spirit continues to fight on with us and to watch over us with those whose lives were taken in the fire. Clary, thank you for your tireless work to help as many people as possible through this terrible, terrible tragedy and trauma. Sis, you will be remembered for your contributions to improving lives and your legacy lives on in our hearts and the hearts of the many people you touched. Humanity for Grenfell. Rest in power, Clary. You will never be forgotten. I lost my mother in that tragedy. She couldn't walk properly. Um, and actually, the very night that um, she was caught in the fire, she was awakened by a neighbor. And she, the last thing that she did, she pointed to her knee saying, I cannot come down. Telling him, I, I cannot come down. So, um, that is saying that, you know, if she was not disabled or if she was on a lower floor, she would have lived. And uh, in this long, agonizing four years, we have gone through hell. Uh, listening to the evidence. Uh, one of the things that uh, have uh, interested me from the very beginning has been the uh, issue of uh, protection uh, for uh, disabled people in high-rise buildings. Uh, now these disabled individuals should have uh, proper protection wherever they're living, but on high-rise building they require extra layer of protection. Um, so what was proposed, uh, which they kind of gave the name PEEP to, uh, was you know personal evacuation plan. Um, these these recommendations, the implementation of it means that people, um, you know, would know what to do in, in case of fire, and the fire department knows where they are and what to do, and who they are. And I truly believe if. Um, these recommendations were in place on 14th of June 2017. The outcome of that fire would have been very much different. They would be alive today. On the 8th of June, the government came up with the result of the second consultation on uh, this recommendation. And I'm glad to say that they are proposing to introduce a new PEEP requirement for uh, residents and disabled residents in high tower blocks. The results is encouraging, but in no way certain yet, because we would like to have this in law rather than be opened up for interpretation by uh, local authorities. Uh, and we, we cannot uh, trust the uh, local authorities to do the right thing. We've seen that time after time, these legislations have kind of failed to kind of become law or be implemented because of vested interests who have uh, politicians and, and, and local authority um, in their back pocket. And this is not a game. Um, people's lives depend upon it, and especially disabled people. Uh, people should feel safe in their homes. It's their human rights. It's not a privilege. You know, for somebody to feel safe in their home, I think it should be there. It is their right, and it should be protected by law. Today marks four years since the Grenfell Tower fire, and still there are so many unanswered questions. Still, the trial is taking way too long, and still no one has been held accountable for that night's events. And yet, Grenfell United are still out here fight entirely for the justice and for the change that not only they deserve, that their community deserve, but that the whole country deserves. And for that, I'd like to thank you. 
Thank you for putting your pain aside for all of these years to fight the fight. I can't imagine the kind of personal consequences that has on you. I really hope that this time next year, you will have the answers that you need to finally, finally be able to breathe together. I love you. I'll see you soon. Stay strong. We're all with you. The fire's destructive rage burn all that was unsafe. But Grenfell stands, it did not fall. Today, Grenfell is a burnt shell covered in tar. It stands because it has to. To remind of the justice that has yet to be done because it cannot fall until change is delivered. And it should stand until those responsible sit in prison. Our dearest loved ones rest in that tower. Respect for them demands full consultation, but the government think they can bring it down behind a veil. Concern for safety while thousands of people are still sleeping in death traps. Ironically, Grenfell is the most safe, unsafe building in London. It could stand for as long as there is life here with political will. It seems that the government want Grenfell out of the skyline to erase it from our memories. Before they cladded the tower, they wanted to demolish it. Grenfell is now earmarked for destruction. Without true consultation, with the victims, their loved ones, and the community as a whole. And most of us can now see why. The skyline is changing, so is the housing, so is the geography. Fracturing our community and making us question whether generations of families belong. Our village feeling is fading away, replaced with soulless greed. And this new shiny London can't sell with buyers staring Grenfell in the face. A constant reminder of corporate greed. Grenfell is a reflection of modern Britain. And if the government take it down, it is because they can no longer look at us, nor themselves in the eye. But we are going nowhere. We continue to stand until there is justice, accountability, and change. Grenfell stands. The bottom line is this. Millions of pounds of public money has been spent on an inquiry in which Boris Johnson promised in Parliament that the recommendations of the inquiry would be implemented immediately. However, following the first phase, we got triangulations from Genric and other government figures saying they had to wait on the opinions of big business. That is a clear act of aggression and violence towards the bereaved, the survivors and this community. When we think about the fact that Arconic were exchanging memos in 2007 questioning what would happen if a fire were to lead to 60 or 70 deaths and literally 10 years later we saw our neighbours in the situation they were in on that terrible night. This is the biggest proof that these corporations knew exactly what they were doing and the government has facilitated this act of social murder against this community. We have to remember when we look at all previous examples of corporate and state crime that the clear motive from the beginning for the state has been to split apart and almost form a hierarchy of suffering and divide the community's concern. The most important point going forward is we have to see not only our commonalities and our bonds as a community but moreover understand those who are also affected by not only the same issues around the world but even in some cases the same companies. If Eric Pickles can rightly be called for his ineptitude and his unwillingness to deal with 
approved document B and other ministers who played their role in the Grenfell story. Why is it that the person responsible for the austerity, which cut a third of the experts from the fire brigade, which cut 29 fire engines, which cut 10 fire stations, including Knightsbridge and Westminster, both which were very close to this tower. Do you know who was responsible for those cuts? None other than the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, at the time. Why is the Prime Minister not only not implementing the recommendations as he promised he would, but why is he also not being called to speak in front of the inquiry? We have to think like the British establishment, whether it is Aberfan or Hillsborough or Piper Alpha. In every situation of state crime and or corporate crime, their main aim has been to split those most affected from those slightly less affected but still affected. This community has to come together, identify clearly who our enemies are, clearly who the companies are that we have to target. In my opinion, this system does not have the capacity within it to deliver us the justice we need. What it can deliver is a carefully managed social injustice situation where we are constantly in a war of all against all. That is not what we need and that is not how we're going to get forward. We owe a debt to those that died. We will not betray the dead and for that reason we have to stand together and we have to target those companies and make their operations as difficult as possible. You have an organisation put together by those most affected by this fire, who come rain, sleet or snow have taken it upon themselves to fight this fight, have taken it to the government and have clearly said again and again, we will not play by your script. This is the reason that we have to stand with Grenfell United today and we have to understand that as broad a coalition as possible is essential for us to continue to make these companies sweat at night. The way that they have traumatised all of us, it must be absolutely abundantly clear to all that the far bigger enemy, aside from any local squabbles that people have among each other, is the companies that killed our neighbours, our families and our friends. That is where the focus has to remain on. Why do the government still have no will to change? Why are those responsible still free? Are the crimes not obvious enough? How can we trust the prospect of criminal justice? When the Metropolitan Police trusted prime suspects to hand over evidence. Why are we spending millions of pounds on a public inquiry if key recommendations are not being implemented? When all you do is lie, have you no shame? Why at the inquiry do so many people suffer from amnesia? How many times do we have to hear, I do not recall? Why is it that four years after Grenfell, disabled people still feel like a minor incident could be a death sentence? Why do those in power think it's okay to neglect their duty of care? How can we heal when local politicians in RBKC think it's okay to slander us publicly? How when they clearly employed plants in a bid to divide and rule? Why have ministers who ignored key warnings been rewarded with peerages? In what world is it fair to allow leaseholders to fall into debt and mental anguish because of your failures? Is history going to repeat itself? How many more lives will have to be lost before the changes we all need are made? Remember, 25 men, 29 women, 17 children and one baby. Many of those lost were vulnerable. Many of those that remain are still vulnerable. We lost 71 people in one catastrophic night. And one shortly after who never recovered. Four years on and we still have to suffer witnessing the caravan of murderous chances from the Royal Borough of Kensington Chelsea and the Kensington Chelsea Tenant Management Organisation giving evidence at the public inquiry. Individuals who have demonstrated that they clearly had no understanding of their roles and responsibilities and who allowed sociopathic council officers to behave like they were engaged in a perverted game of monopoly. To add further pain to our suffering, we learn that many of the TMO and RBKC staff who perpetrated the Grenfell atrocity 
are still being employed by the council. One employee covered up 19 safety breaches at Grenfell Tower and is now working on the council's response to COVID. We have seen RBKC's total lack of contrition as they continue to use products manufactured by killer companies. What is clear is that without regulation, even homes being built today are unsafe the minute that they're complete. We have a building scandal. Thousands of homes are still unsafe. Lobbyists ensure the system protects the corrupt. We have seen how rigged this world is. How enforcement of regulations simply did not exist. We have seen how the crooks and killers from Celotex and Kingspan have gamed the regulations. Criminal fraud with murderous consequences. Criminal fraud with murderous consequences. Their greed masked raging infernos. Their greed killed. Yet across the country, the products that killed our families and burned us out of our homes are still being sold. Our chronic were warned of the dangers of mass death. The death toll was foretold. Yet our chronic continued to market their products as safe while knowing it would spread an inferno. They knew. They gambled and our loved ones paid with their lives. They promised us no stone would be left unturned, but our conic blocked our pursuit of truth. We've seen how Hillsborough's justice was delayed, only then to be denied. They were denied justice because those culpable were justice. We are sick of waiting to see the criminals go through the courts. Time has not made this any easier. The pursuit of justice is exhausting and soul-destroying, but we do it because we have to. That is why Grenfell United exists. That is why Grenfell United exists. That is why Grenfell United exists. What was lost on the 14th of June can never be returned. The grief at our core cannot be soothed. We have never lost sight of the fact that Grenfell affected people across the country. The disaster spanned the world. We do what we do because the thought of others suffering what we had to is unbearable. We do what we do to improve rights for tenants. And if anybody violates those fundamental rights, then they are criminals. We exist because what was needed after the fire was not forthcoming. We exist because the horror we live through could have been avoided if they just listened to us. We exist because if anything is to happen that resembles justice, we will have fought tooth and nail for it. We all have to face a stark reality. This government does not care. They have calculated that their future is not bound to our justice. Minister after minister have passed the buck. They forget that history is writing itself and their legacy will be lies, deceit and indifference. They have betrayed humanity for corporate donations. We knew we had to run a marathon to get justice, but we won't do so on a treadmill. We will take the ground before us. We will fight for truth, justice and change. We need your help to do it. It's time to stand united. It's time to stand united. It's time to stand united. The government have deluded themselves. They think you don't stand with us, but we know differently. They don't understand that we are you and you are us. We know the whole country wants to see criminal prosecutions for what happened to us. We know the whole country wants evacuation plans for those living with disabilities. We know the whole country wants homes to be safe and fit for human habitation. We cannot and will not ask people to live in unsafe homes. We know the whole country needs to see the corruption, corporate greed and criminal negligence punished by law. We will not allow the lessons of this tragedy to fall through the cracks. The line between grief and rage is a thin one. Let them know they have a debt to every single one of us. Let them know we are ready to collect.